And I've got 10 seconds. Okay, let's get this started. This is a presentation by some Eden partners. I am Scott Cotton from the University of Wyoming and our presenter today talking about extension disaster competency. What you need to know is Dr. Keith Tidball from Cornell University and I'll turn it over to him, but first let me ask everyone that comes on to consider turning your video and muting your mics so that we don't have any background sound. I'll do the same thing, thank you. All right, thank you, Scott, and thank you, fellow members of the Extension Disaster Education Network, some of which are on on the, uh, I guess we got 26 or no, 31 participants now, so welcome to all of you. Um, as Scott said, I am from Cornell University. I am the Assistant Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension for Disaster Education, Military Families and Veterans, and have been working with uh, Eden for, for quite a while now. And this, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, what disaster competency is, why we need to have that competency, especially in the world of extension, and, uh, and, and determine what it is that we need to know. Get a little feedback from somewhere. Scott, maybe you could turn your mic off? Mine's off, or was. MSUES seems to have a microphone on, whoever that is. All right, so our training objectives today, while we get that microphone sorted out, are, are four. First, to understand the role of cooperative extension in disaster incident management. Second, to become familiar with National Incident Management System, NIMS, and the Incident Command System, and even the National Response Framework. Third, to identify appropriate roles for cooperative extension when presented multiple scenarios, and you all will help with that. And finally, to locate and commence continuing professional education in NIMS and ICS. And we'll get to these acronyms here shortly. So let's start with our mandate. Uh, normally, in extension, we think about our sort of mothership as USDA or the US Department of Agriculture. In this case, we're, we're looking towards uh, not only them, but also another agency, the D Department of Homeland Security, US Department of Homeland Security, where we get our mandate via the National Preparedness Goal which you can see here and you can reference. I'll provide a link to that later in the presentation. Uh, in that uh, document, they spell out very clearly, and some of these slides will be a little wordy, and I did that on purpose for us to be able to refer back to them or to post these on websites. So uh, the idea around preparedness is that it's a shared responsibility. It's for everybody. It's not just for one agency or one set of folks. It's a whole community concept. It begins with people, individuals, and moves through communities. Uh, the private and nonprofit sectors, faith-based organizations, all the way up through governments, uh, whether that be local, municipal, tribal, territorial, state, all the way up to federal. And in, in, a, in a single sentence, the National Preparedness Goal is a secure and resilient nation with the capabilities required across the whole community to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the threats and hazards that pose the greatest risk. So embedded in that preparedness goal, I think, are a lot of the mission statements for cooperative extension systems throughout the land-grant system. And I hope that we can capitalize on that and, and visualize that as we move through this presentation today. Within that national preparedness goal are core capabilities, which are needed to meet the national preparedness goal. And those core capabilities are not exclusive to any single government or agency or organization but again, require the combined efforts of the whole community. And there's certainly a large role for, for cooperative extension in that domain. The link there is, is hot. Uh, if you wanna use it and, and check that out on one of your other screens, you're welcome to do that. That's the Preparedness School second edition right in here. So when we think about how that relates to cooperative extension, um, we haven't been um, strangers to this. We've been involved in these kinds of big goals, preparedness goals, response goals, since our inception, since over 100 years. Uh, what I, I have as a, an example here, this is about a 100-page uh, booklet right here from New York State's extension system when we were the College of Agriculture instead of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, wartime and other emergency activities of the New York State Extension Service. So, and I'm sure that many of you from your respective states have documents like this and histories like this. We have, as a system, developed a little amnesia 
about our roles in these things, uh, with the exception of those of us working in Eden, it sometimes is more difficult than we would like it to be to convince our stakeholders and our leaders that we, we have been and should continue to be engaged in this. And part of what we will learn here today is you know, developing this competency uh, helps us make that case. So let's move um, to somebody that's done a little research around cooperative extensions role in the disaster context, and that's Franklin Bottler. It's, uh, he was the deputy administrator for economic and community systems when it was CS Rees, Cooperative State Research, Education, and Extension at USDA. That's now NIFA. He, he says, and here's his quote, you can read it, extension plays a significant role in enabling families, communities, and businesses to successfully respond to critical incidents. He goes on to say that local extension agents often function as critical nodes of communication in rural areas, particularly when the normal systems have gone down. He finalizes this quote there is saying, indeed, in reviewing responses to Katrina, some observed that when extension agents were closely tied to the state's disaster response team, communications flowed much more quickly to affected individuals. So that's an important uh, statement, a testimony, if you will, from somebody in the higher echelons of leadership at the time at USDA, and I think helps us centralize this notion that there can and should be a framework for cooperative extension in the larger disaster context. <clears throat> so developing this framework for extension's role has been ongoing for some time. A major publication in 2007 by the aforementioned fella uh, had, had basically pointed to two mechanisms that we could be involved in in the response mission area or the response phase, and that's serving as nodes of communication dispersal or, uh, and dissemination and the facilitation for preparation and planning efforts. Now, that's a little muddled because the, the statement says it's in the response uh, mission area, but there is this, this second mechanism about preparation and planning efforts. So in, in 2015, I began to work around and publish some concepts that we can be a little more holistic in terms of cooperative extension and its, and its roles. And, and, and in addition to these communication, dissemination, and facilitation roles, also many other opportunities exist for us in uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, and the recovery mission areas, which are part of, of the response plan that we're, we'll be talking about further. And it, most of you already know this, but the Extension Disaster Education Network has been demonstrating these possibilities since its inception. Uh, some some decades ago now. Um, the reality is, however, we haven't codified this or haven't put this in any clear uh, single briefing document, uh, and that's, uh, that's some work to come and hopefully one of the outcomes of, of today's presentation. I've mentioned the National Preparedness Goal. These are the mission areas. I also just mentioned them briefly in the last slide. Some people think of these as um, in, you know, areas or phases of the disaster cycle, but we'll talk about them as mission areas today. That's prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. And the way that these things roll out for us uh, is as core capabilities. Um, in the National Preparedness Goal, the core capabilities are the, the, the critical elements necessary for our nation's success, and those usually trickle down to a very similar preparedness goal for uh, your respective state. <clears throat> and then and the, the numbering of those is often pretty consistent. These uh, goals, uh, these core capabilities within the National Preparedness Goal are interdependent. There's some overlap. Um, they require the, the disaster community, the disaster response and planning community to use networks and activities. It requires coordination and unification of effort, uh, training and exercise programs. Many of the things that we in Cooperative Extension are familiar with and engage in. And, and, and that's even on the administrative finance and logistics side of, of the house. Uh, we have ability to provide uh, resources and, and information and knowledge to support those activities. And finally, the core capabilities serve as both preparedness tools and, and means of implementation. So we're talking about all kinds of instances across the sort of whole community perspective ha have been able to prove the usefulness of these core capabilities and the coordinating structures that sustain and deliver um, those preparedness goal critical core capabilities. So let's break that down a little bit. I did mention those, those uh, mission areas, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. You see those across the top. I'm not gonna do a super deep dive on this today. We're just doing a sort of hit the wave top so you understand what the competencies are that, that we're trying to develop. 
if you follow down from prevention and protection, mitigation, response, and recovery, you can see the sort of uh, critical areas. Planning, public information and warning, and operational coordination are cross-sectional. They go across all five areas. But you get a little more specific on the prevention and protection side in the intelligence information sharing and so forth. Go ahead and scan through this chart. We don't need to read every word on it now, but I would draw your attention to a couple of the things happening in the intelligence information sharing public information that are obviously going to be relevant to extension. And that section in the middle in mitigation uh, is, is also uh, highly relevant to our work in cooperative extension, as well as a few other items in the recovery phase. And on the next slide here, we're going to talk about what are the areas that we have had experience in cooperative extension actively working in, in terms of uh, the, this, um, these capabilities. Uh, the, the, mo the most dark orange are the ones that we most commonly find ourselves working in, and, and, and the middle color orange is something we find ourselves working in often, but not all the time. And then occasionally we find ourselves in the sort of lighter yellow one. So let's look at over here. Uh, well, let's start up at the top. The darkest orange, public information and warning. This is an area that we as Cooperative Extension excel in and can help with at the local, state, and even uh, federal level. We have uh, vast systems of communication, networks, websites, lists, uh, stakeholder groups, social media, all kinds of platforms to put out information and warning to assist with those efforts. So that's a no-brainer. And on the intelligence and information sharing side over here, uh, in the prevention protection phase, uh, we're especially capable ahead of an event to provide assistance with uh, messaging and information sharing. In the mitigation phase, there are a number of things that many states' cooperative extension systems have been engaged in in one form or another. Community resilience, vulnerability reduction, risk and disaster resilience assessments, less so threat and hazard identification, although we do do this in, in some cases. Uh, there's room to grow there for, for many state systems. <clears throat> and if we go over to in the recovery phase, then we have an exceptionally uh, visible role to play in natural and cultural resources, certainly, which is where the agriculture and, and uh, our core mission areas from historically in cooperative extension often show brightest. But you also see health and social services and economic recovery are roles that we can play in cooperative extension and often do in various ways. And just because housing isn't highlighted doesn't mean we can't or haven't done that. It's just not something that I personally have been familiar with, and so I can't speak to that. But I do know uh, of other cases when I look through the history on Eden uh, of I issues where it looks to me that Cooperative Extension has been engaged in the housing side, and I hope to hear from you all on this webinar a little later uh, about that. So with that framework and that sort of uh, schematic, uh, you see that there's the, the potential exists for this sort of um, national preparedness goal, cooperative extension nexus framework. We need to spend a little more time on this. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. I apologize for the occasional cough or throat clearing. If we spend a little more time on this, we'll be able to do, uh, to create a standalone sort of document or briefing that clearly illustrates how cooperative extension can, has, uh, plugged into those capability areas. And uh, I would say that uh, this is something that I'm working on. I know Scott and others in Eden have expressed interest to in this. We've talked about it. So hopefully this will be something that gets done in the next year or so and we'll have that for, uh, for our use. I also wanted to make sure that for those of you in the extension community that are interested in where we might find uh, you know, uh, literature that legitimizes our role in disaster, here are just a handful, I think, of important publications published in the Journal of, of Extension dealing with how Cooperative Extension has been engaged in the uh, Homeland Security mission, the disaster mission, and the recovery mission, uh, uh, broadly speaking. And again, these are all hyperlinked for your use, either now or later. <clears throat> so uh, returning to our training objectives, we've crossed off the first one. So we're going to move now to uh, becoming familiar with the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System. This is not to take the place of you taking this training. It's, it's actually to convince you to be uh, interested in going and taking the training, but I am gonna go in some depth, uh, specifically with incident command, hitting the wave tops and sort of summarizing in executive summary fashion. Um, so buckle your seatbelts. This is gonna be some heavy, heavy stuff and a lot of information, but I think you'll find it useful and help you understand how we fit in. So here is the 
uh, typical in this business uh, acronym SOUP, the introduction to the NRF slash NIMS slash ICS and why you need it. So the NRF, <clears throat> that is the National Response Framework. And that is where we get guidance on who's doing what, on how we're aligned for efficiency and effectiveness during response operations. It describes specific authorities and relationships for management of the incident. Um, and it goes from the, the, you know, the, the, the trash fire you know, in the backyard all the way up to the largest catastrophic national natural disaster. It scales from small to large. It is not to be confused with the response plan, but it does provide this basis for developing uh, plans at all levels. Then we get into NIMS, the National Incident Management System, uh, which is one of the ways that the government responds to emergencies and disasters. It's the main way we'll interact uh, with the government in terms of, of response. The other one is more for the military community. And then finally, NIMS isn't to be confused with uh, Incident Command System or ICS. So the, the National Incident Management System actually employs ICS when a disaster strikes. Okay, so now we got some of that terminology straight. Let's, uh, let's break these down a little bit. NIMS uh, came from the Homeland, Secur uh, Homeland Security Policy Directive back in 2005, and it's the way uh, disaster management is coordinated, and it definitely is something that needs coordination. We learned a lot of lessons after uh, September 11th, 2001 about coordination, um, and, and, and the World Trade Center is, was part of that story. Uh, so in order to uh, prepare for ev uh, future events, uh, prevent and then manage responses, uh, this, this document was developed, this system was developed um, to manage uh, our personnel and our processes. And you can see the, the document there on, on the left, that is something that will be also available at the end with all the other documentation for you. <clears throat> Within uh, that NIMS framework, it's often asked, so how do we fit in? There are 15 emergency support functions generally. Sometimes there's even a few more added in there and, and the system is flexible to allow for that. The ones I've highlighted in yellow are the ones we're most likely to find ourselves working in. Um, emergency support function 11, agriculture and natural resources. Clearly we have a lot to contribute there. 14 and 15 also, long-term community recovery and external affairs. That is not to say there aren't lots of areas in all those other support functions where cooperative extension couldn't get involved, and I'll ask you to think about that now and uh, be prepared to talk about that in a little bit um, where you see your own experience or, or uh, capacity fitting into some of these support functions. But generally speaking, 11, 14, and 15 are where we're most likely to find action. So what are those? 11. That's the Ag and Natural Resources one. That one generally flows pretty cleanly from the federal program to the state program and often even to, even to the county and, and local jurisdictions. Um, you'll, if, you, if you read through here, you're gonna see words that should ring bells all over the place for extension folks. Uh, working uh, in actual and potential incidents to provide nutrition assistance, animal agriculture health issues, provide technical expertise, coordination support for animal and ag emergency management, uh, safety and defense of the food supply, and natural and cultural resources. So this stuff here is right in our wheelhouse, right in, in our lane. Uh, there's, there's, we don't have to make a lot of justification to be involved in this emergency support function, and we should be more involved than we currently are, frankly, as a, as a cooperative extension system. Um, number 14, long-term community recovery and mitigation. That is, is, kind of speaks for itself. Um, we are a, a, a clearinghouse as cooperative extension as situated in the, the land grant university system of available programs and resources uh, and federal departments and agencies to enable community recovery, especially long-term recovery and to reduce or eliminate risk from future incidents. This is something that makes a lot of sense for us to be engaged in as well. Uh, and it, I would encourage you to take a look at those annexes. They are hot links as well. Uh, if you want to, to get more in depth on what's, re what's required there or what the opportunities might be. <clears throat> so now we move to uh, ICS, Incident Command System, and that is the actual personnel management structure. And I would remind those that have joined, if you wouldn't mind muting your microphone, that would help uh, reduce the feedback uh, overall on the presentation. 
So the personnel management structure is basically how we can think about incident command systems. And it was developed by California. It was a way to deal with wildfire earthquakes and other emergencies that they were dealing with and wanted to handle more efficiently. And the main, the main uh, attraction of this ICS is that it's flexible. It can grow or shrink depending on the incident. And when it's properly implemented, it allows the development of a, a, a chain of command pretty much of any size that can facilitate an efficient response. And what we need to do is learn how we fit into that and actually operate within that effectively. So we're going to do a little deeper dive on that. That is a critical thing for us to be aware of and understand. So let's talk about the incident command system. It's the standard on-scene organizational framework that is used to coordinate emergency responses for all types of hazardous incidents including animal health emergencies. Um, it has three very basic elements. First, it defines and organizes personnel, facilities, equipment, and communications by using standard terminology. Standard terminology is key. We can't have a lot of jargon that others don't understand. Also uses standard personnel units and standard supervisor titles. We'll get into that a little bit later. Secondly, it is a modular system that's flexible and it's adaptable. The command structure can expand or contract depending on the situation and based on the size and complexity of the incident at the, uh, at the behest of the incident commander. It also allows for the cooperation of multiple agencies. It allows for efficient and effective management of incidents that span multiple sites or multiple jurisdictions. So the use of the incident command system for all responses actually is mandated, uh, federal mandate, by the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, that we talked about earlier. So let's talk about the structure. The structure is, as I mentioned, a top-down system. It's organized into five major functions, each of which perform specific duties, and they are the incident command, um, which can include the incident commander, the uh, command staff and general staff, and um, operations, planning, logistics, and finance administration sections, which these guys are here. Those are the sections. And we're going to talk just a little bit in detail on each of those. So that's the structure. And then they, that thing can expand depending on the incident, however needed. And we'll, we'll demonstrate that here shortly. Who is the incident commander? I've mentioned that phrase. That is the person uh, at the top. That's the overall uh, responsible individual for who's managing the incident. And responsibilities of that position include setting incident objectives, uh, determining the strategies uh, for how to address that incident, and establishing priorities for the response. It's a very important position given, given the priority setting. It's the only position in the incident command system that is always, always staffed during an incident. There will always be an incident command er, incident commander. The incident commander is, uh, is responsible for all the objectives and, and until they are delegated out to other commander, general staff, personnel. So the buck stops at the incident commander. So in any, any incident, however small or large, there will always be uh, that individual uh, in, on the scene. Or that person needs to establish who they are and let everybody else know who they are so that that person is on the scene. Let's talk about the command staff. Uh, thinking back to the, the tree that we, we just saw, uh, during, you'll see this during larger incidents. Uh, there'll be a need for additional supervisory positions. And so the command staff reports directly to the incident commander and generally includes a safety officer, which I, which I, I circled for you, uh, whose job is to monitor and oversee, you know, working conditions of the incident. And that person is also uh, responsible for developing procedures to keep people safe. Uh, that safety officer is allowed to stop any unsafe behavior or procedure. Uh, and then there's the liaison officer, who is the primary contact for other supporting agencies involved in the incident response. Initially, if cooperative extension is involved, often that uh, invitation to become involved and fit into the structure will come from the liaison officer. Then there's a public information officer who provides information to stakeholders, including the media, regarding response activities. That's important to understand that there is that position generally in a larger incident and not to uh, step on them. Uh, our role in cooperative extension will be explained to us as a part of the, the, the incident commander's guidance and vision for how things are to move. And one of the things that we have to be careful of is not to get ahead of 
the public information officer with any information that's true of everybody that's working for the command staff. And then the, the incident commander does perform a lot of these roles until these positions are named and then assigned. In smaller incidents, you might not see all of these uh, positions rolled up. Let's talk now about that general staff. Um, this, uh, these people are responsible for specific tasks and duties uh, and specific groups of personnel. They are um, the operations section, the planning section, these four across the bottom here, um, the logistics and the finance. All of them are led by a corresponding section chief or an operations section chief, or in some cases these, these sections will be broken out by a, a, another kind of functionality at the state level, which we'll talk about here in just a moment with an example. The operations section uh, is where we will find ourselves generally assigned and busy uh, in, in, in ICS. Uh, the operations section is responsible for the performance of tasks that are needed to meet the goals of the response as outlined by the incident action plan, which is developed by the incident commander and his staff or her staff. Uh, that includes developing and organizing tactical assignments and directing all tactical resources. For the really big incidents like uh, Hurricane Sandy or Katrina that we mentioned or wildfire events out west or flooding in the Mississippi, uh, the operations section is often divided into to divisions, which are geographical areas of operation sometimes, like by town or by uh, municipality, or into groups that are be, instead of geographical, they'll be functional areas like disease diagnosis or biosecurity or appraisal groups or something like that. And if the number of groups or divisions exceeds the span of control, which is a specific number that we can easily handle, usually five to seven people, if it exceeds that, then a new branch can get formed so that you don't have too many people, more people than you can control. And depending on the needs of the incident, specialized strike teams might, you might find them, especially if you got a lot of trees down in an urban area, strike teams are often formed by uh, tree teams, and, and you probably have experienced some of that in the past. Uh, the operations section is supervised by the operations section chief. The planning section is engaged in collecting, evaluating, and disseminating information pertaining to an incident. They're also involved in maintaining the status of available resources. They also prepare and document the incident action plan, so they get kind of tasked to get that plan going and uh, start drafting on that right away in an incident. And then they track the resources for the response according to that plan. There are some subdivisions in the planning section. Those are called units, uh, as opposed to the groups or divisions that are over in the ops uh, section. The planning section is supervised by the planning section chief. In logistics, uh, you have a, uh, this is like sort of self-explanatory, I suppose. This is support resources and services needed to meet the incident objectives. Uh, it might include personnel, supplies, facilities, food, communications equipment, uh, transportation, and so forth. They are often divided into two branches, the service branch and the support branch, as you can see there, where the incidents are large or where they have a number of facilities or they're spread out. Um, subdivisions within the logistics sections are also called units, not groups or divisions like in the ops section. The logistics section is supervised by a logistics section chief. Notice the uniformity across the title, that's by design. Finally, in the finance and administration section, these folks are, are accounting for loss and passing out money. They're doing accounting, they're doing procurement, they're doing time recording and cost analysis. Um, they monitor costs associated with the actual incident management. And they, in, in, in our cases, many times in the agricultural sector, they're also monitoring costs and damages and, and doing appraisals and assessments. Um, they are also called units in uh, their, their subgroups or subdivisions, not um, groups or divisions like in the ops section. And again, the finance and administration uh, leader is the section chief. So all of that leads uh, us to how do those groups work together? Well, they work together through the incident action plan and that is a required first step once the uh, once there is, once once there is an incident and incident command is 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 begun, um, the incident action plan outlines the necessary goals and actions required for the situation, and it provides direction for the response. 
at, you know, at, at a very basic level, it should address the goals and procedures that are needed for the response and who is responsible for what, for what tasks. It also should outline how communication is going to occur and how the responder health and safety procedures are going to be handled. Um, it usually uh, is, it is, is intended to be written in a form um, that is understandable by all in clean and clear text. And it's generally developed, as I said, by the planning section in coordination with the incident commander. Now, that was a lot, I know. It was like you asked for a little drink and you got a fire hose, I'm sorry. But now you know, at least in structure, how the incident command system works and can en envision or imagine how we in Cooperative Extension can fit into that and how we should not step outside of our lanes or muddle or confuse the system. And the way we do that is by fully appreciating the system that we're working within and why it exists. So let's just quickly do an exercise here where um, in an animal health incident, let's break this out a little bit. You have, as we talked about, you have this the incident commander and some staff uh, working up here in the highest echelon. You got some sections across here, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. Under there, you've got a few branches working on stuff. Uh, and then some divisions or groups. Here is where, as I've said earlier, and there's a typo there, I apologize. This is where extension will often uh, play a role either as a single resource with a certain sort of skill set or capacity that we have that we can bring to bear, or as a system, it, as is often the case in, in my home state in New York, um, the cooperative extension system of the state of New York, since we're all state employees, and our land grant experts become uh, a system, uh, basically like a, a team, uh, which is huge in terms of span of control. We have to deal with that in, inside our own extension system to, to be able to be consistent with ICS and we, and we do our best to do that. Uh, then in, in this animal health incident, if you look down planning, you can see that there's a demobilization unit that would probably be unique to animal health. Uh, also unique to animal health incident would be, um, you know, looking at this compensation, how extension might play a role there is part of it will, will happen often if there's a livestock that have to be um, taken down is that there will be values for that and, and cooperative extension ag folks often help with the veterinary expertise and others uh, in that area if they have knowledge of, of the agriculture uh, industry in there in that locale where the incident occurs. Um, let's see, uh, there was a wrong button. So let's talk about these titles really briefly. Um, they are important to be consistent and even inside your extension systems when you're working to become Lego-like and be able to plug into the ICS, uh, titles should be consistent and not muddy the waters. So the incident commander clearly is, we understand what that is. All those command staffs are called officers. So public information, safety, and liaison officers. We know they're up there working as part of the staff of the incident commander. That these uh, staff sections um, are going to be chiefs across here. The people working directly under them in branches are going to be directors. In divisions or groups, they're going to be supervisors. And once you get down here, they're, they're basically leaders. Um, and it's probably going to vary state by state where extension fits in that and what kind of titling that your state or county ICS um, system is going to like you to use, but that's something to, to work out and understand. And the time to do that, obviously, is before a disaster, not, not during. Uh, an example from my state, um, these are a little hard to read. They're, they're, they're blurry, but what's basically going on here is you got a kind of blown out incident command structure with agencies and so forth. Here you have an emergency operations center manager who is like the tip of the spear in the, in the ops center. Under that, you've got... Uh, your section chief, organizational section chief here. And for us, we fall over here in the health and human services branch with uh, emergency support function six, eight, and 11. And, and generally 11 is the desk that I sit with others at in the emergency operation center. Let's uh, expand upon that a little bit. So again, rem remembering our ICS structure, here's the section. That's the operations section chief. Here's the branch that we've talked about. This is the health and human services branch. And you see that there are other, uh, other folks out here, other branches, public safety over here, here's infrastructure. But we're working here in cooperative extension, generally speaking. And then in the division or group frame, uh, here we are, ESF 11, 
and that's the New York State Emergency Support Function, number 11, Agriculture and Natural Resources, which has about a 50-page uh, standard operating procedure that includes some tasking for extension or extension-like uh, activity. I've pretty much uh, hit the, the wave tops of the ICS system. If you want a deeper dive, there's a lot more to learn about this, and I would encourage you to, to learn it. Um, there are a number of resources on this page. This is a great, uh, great little clearinghouse right here at, at FEMA's Emergency Management Institute, including training, which we'll get to later. Also, um, like job descriptions and position checklists and lots of uh, glossaries of terms. Pretty much everything you need to get up to speed and start functioning within this system as an extension professional within the larger sort of emergency management context is, is available on this resource center. It's a great resource. And hopefully you can see the uh, hot link here at the bottom where you can get to that uh, clearinghouse. Bottom line for extension and, and, and uh, ICS is to know your role. Uh, the, the biggest problem and the reason all this stuff exists is because it's really bad news when people get out of their lanes and start stepping on each other and, and duplicating work or, or, or wasting time and efficiency and resources because people don't know what their jobs are and who, who should do what and when. So um, knowing your role means for cooperative extension, it's, it's time to interact and discuss with, if you're a county extension uh, a staff person, talk with your county. If you work at the administrative level at the state, then talk to state or both. In any case, start speaking with them about how you feel, and especially uh, hopefully what you learned today, how you feel and, and can document that cooperative extension can be involved and play an important role in their response. And if you are able to talk their language and say where you plug in, uh, that certainly helps make that case. Then engage in drills and exercises. I'm involved today. I actually keep seeing it flash over here on my third screen to my left. Uh, today is Empire Shield. We've got four states going. We've got a, uh, an exercise or a drill where we've got a, a nuclear detonation in the Lincoln Tunnel. And it's, it's on, full on, and cooperative extension is a part of it. Uh, six or seven counties plus New York City plus our state system is actively engaged in that drill. And those things are things that I would encourage you to get involved in in your own states. And again, as I mentioned earlier, during the middle of a disaster is not uh, a good time for introductions. Uh, hey, here we are with cooperative extension. How can we help? Uh, the time is in, in the preparedness uh, time at the beginning of the disaster cycle, if you will, or in that first mission area that we discussed. All right, take a breath. That was the hardest part. I hope everybody's still with me. I hope you're, uh, you're not a deer in headlights or else you're looking at your eyelids. Um, so we can cross that, becoming familiar with National Incident Management System and Incident Command System off our list now. Now it's time to uh, hear from you a little bit. I'd like to work on identifying appropriate roles that you're thinking about or that you've had experience with in the past uh, when uh, cooperative extension was involved in, in this kind of thing. So um, let's try to do this in an orderly fashion. If there are people that want to unmute uh, and, and hit these topics, um, I'm going to encourage it. What, is there anybody on this call, I'm, I'm thinking Scott probably has something to contribute here, that can talk about their experience with um, ICS and involvement in, in disaster in the wildfire context. Is there anybody on here that can speak to that? I'll wait a few seconds. Anyone? I, uh, if, if you want me to, you know, of course, um, Keith, you realize I've um, had a previous checkered life as a firefighter and law enforcement EMS and it bled over into extension work very quickly. Um, usually those instances, as you indicated, uh, if you knew uh, who you're working with and they knew your capability, they would very quickly uh, utilize the resources that extension provides and we're very grateful for it. In fact, most of them would uh, put you on high on their list to call next time they had an incident, whether it was wildfire, flood or blizzard or whatever, when, they learned how extension works. And the comment I kept getting repeatedly was, wow, you guys multitask very quickly. You know everybody, you know where things are, and you seem comfortable working in a semi-chaotic environment. And I think that's partly our fair background, but it, it ties right in. Thanks, Scott. That's, I think that's, that's a good point. And, and uh, as we brainstorm a little bit how in our own systems we might be able to identify roles for us in in this and we can please have a look at those four bullet points there and and think something up 
Uh, one thing that I'm aware of, you know, in terms of leadership at Cornell, uh, of our cooperative extension system is everybody's looking for ways to make sure that we maintain a high degree of visibility and viability and relevance in our communities, uh, in, in among our counties and, and our states, so that we continue to be funded. Well, I can tell you that when you know, in my experience, when you're you, we're providing the kind of stuff that cooperative extension provides when people need it most in disaster and and, and crisis and a catastrophe, that people are going to remember that you were there. And that certainly helps with the visibility, viability, relevance issue uh, in, in major ways. Anybody else uh, want to try to think about or, or provide a, a suggestion or a thought about how extension might play a role, given what we've just learned in an animal incident or a terror incident or flooding or hurricane? Uh, this is Betsy Green in Arizona. And so, of course, we've got fires right now uh, hitting pretty heavy and have some animal uh, and people evacuations and such with because of the strong winds. Uh, I actually have more experience in the floods from when I was in Vermont during Irene and we were making connections with folks when bridges were washed out and things like that, getting some donations of hay or feed and or feed and or hay pellets so that we could actually get them to the animals that had, you know, the folks that had no access because the whole road was washed out. And would, mm -hmm. uh, but right now, we're working on trying to do some resource identification because a lot of times folks don't know about the where, to, where they could take their animals, where they could get some feed and things like that. So we're doing some of that stuff, and we're in early planning on that. Outstanding. Thank you, Betsy, and, and, uh, for being here and for, for that comment. Uh, clearly, uh, there, you know, even in informal ways, we're being leaned on in, in, in disaster often as extension to provide some help. I think we can be even more effective if we understand how to be effective via these systems, NIMS, ICS, and we start making those connections. Then, uh, then those uh, responders who are working in an emergency operations center can say, oh, Betsy's crew is already doing some hay relief or this, that, or the other. Let's, uh, let's push that out further and see if we can invest in that. So that's a great example. Uh, are there other thoughts or examples? Sure, Keith. This is Tommy Bass at Montana State University. Hi, Tommy. I'm the state um, animal waste and livestock environment specialist. And um, I was on loan to USDA uh, in Minnesota uh, during HPAI and uh, as a, a mortality composting subject matter expert. <laughs> so very much um, inserted into these management structures you discussed. Uh, and I think um, having the familiarity from previous trainings on how to work within ICS was important. Um, but, you know, I was not in my geographic area of, you know, um, experience, but I feel like just the knowing agriculture as a culture and extension as a culture, um, you know, is able to to fit right in and work with uh, the depopulation teams uh, following behind them to provide that mortality composting uh, advice and then monitoring as well to make sure we had uh, virus deactivation. But anyway, that's probably no enough to say about that. Um, let me, follow, let me follow up with you on that, Tommy. That's great and, and uh, interesting information. You, can you tell us or share with the group how much uh, ICS training had you had before you found yourself in the structure doing things in real time? Um, sure. Um, it was really um, relatively minor, uh, a couple online trainings and then participating in an exercise or two um, here in Montana. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say I had the bare minimum of training, but then a, a relative amount of, say, scholarly pursuit and reading on on the system and its and its histories right excellent thank you tommy for sharing that uh are others others have thoughts or experiences they'd like to share on the on the subject hi this is, this faith. is gregory martin can you hear me i got gregory and i got faith uh gregory can you stand by while faith talks and then we'll hit you next sure thing go ahead faith Hi, I'm on the um, avian influenza uh, response team for the state of Georgia. And part of the reason I was put on that team 10 years ago was because I had um, done the training and was certified as a, as a public information officer. Oh, awesome. uh, 
we hoped we would never have to use that training, but we had to use it this year. We had a, an outbreak, but luckily ours was low path. Um, but it was, it was very interesting to see how it actually worked once it was put into place. Um, some things were different than the plan. Some things went right as planned. But mostly um, what they used me for was to funnel information from the command center to extension so that we could get the information they needed us to get mm -hmm. into the hands of people on the ground. So the, the industry is very integrated and everything was taken care of for the industry-wide people. It was the backyard flock owners that we really needed to get to. And we were able to do that by having extension agents on the ground who could get information into feed stores and uh, into veterinarians and people who were having that one-on-one -on -one contact with the backyard flock owners. And it really worked well. And I was, I was so glad I had done the training and it, it comes back to you in a crisis. I really appreciate those comments, Faith, and, and uh, I'm glad that that situation worked out. Uh, we may circle back to you uh, at the end of this presentation for, for a little more uh, input, or certainly in, in the future, I'd like to talk with you about that more. And was it Gregory, uh, you wanted to chime in too? Let's hear what you have to say about this. Um, I'm Gregory Martin with Penn State Extension. Uh, I was unable to get into the Zoom conference. I'm calling only from telephone, so I don't see all the visuals, so forgive Sorry me. Sorry about that. Um, I am uh, I am on the avian influenza task force. I'm a poultry educator uh, by training, and I've had ICS training up to the 300 level uh, and some 400 level courses with FEMA. Uh, the reason why I have that much training is that I'm in the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant uh, EPZ zone, so that means that we train every we drill every year on nuclear uh, catastrophes just as you do and so um, a lot of interf interfacing with uh, our county and state uh, emergency management uh, operatives and we also have in place a high path ai task force as well that goes out and works with um, different assets uh, to uh, put down avian flu as we find it so there's a lot of interfacing on there. But the one thing I wanted to share was uh, something as mundane as traffic accidents and rollovers. Uh, we have several interstates that run through the state and we've had on occasion two or three serious accidents that have involved animals uh, in transport. And many of the fire departments that roll up on these events really don't have any animal handling experience. So extension um, agents have been on pulled on scene to help with the directing uh, response activities on the crash site so interesting thank uh, you for sharing that and uh, again right. the, what we ought to do and, and this this strikes me as something that'll be a next step after this is to actually try to collect a lot of these stories um, as a way for people who are new to this and I hope there are a number of you on this call and on this webinar that are new to this concept to be able to get some you know, practical guidance from people that are actually doing this, like the, like we heard from Faith and Gregory and <coughs> others. Uh, I'm going to need to move on uh, here so that we don't go past the hour. But uh, if you would like to continue to talk about those experiences in the chat, I encourage you to do that because those can be captured too as a part of the archive of this, uh, which we'll be able to hang on to and refer back to and actually use as a way to go forward with capturing additional stories and sharing those as sort of field notes. Um, and I apologize for those of you that aren't able to see the slides. I, I realize now there's a couple of people that have joined by phone. And if you're looking for those slides later, we'll be sure and provide them for you. Um, let's talk about what we should do next. Faith mentioned that she was glad and so did others. Uh, glad she actually did have the training in her back pocket. Uh, that's where we are in our objectives from the beginning of this webinar is that let's talk a little bit about what are the options? What can we do for continuing professional education in NIMS and ICS? Uh, and there's a nice little chart here. The baseline is just get ICS 100 and IS 700 under your belt. Um, and again, these are hot linked. Uh, you, can, you can click on those links to be able to get to those courses if you're interested. Uh, and then if you want to do some additional training or you get assigned, as a couple of people that spoke here have been assigned, um, then um, you can go, go ahead for ICS 400, 300, 800, and so forth. And let's let me give you a little description of what we're talking about. So 
baseline, <clears throat> the IS700, there's somebody with an unmuted un, um, mic there, keeping in pretty good. IS700 NIMS is, is your basic introduction to the National Incident uh, Management System. That is a, is a great introduction to the entire template. So everybody, you know, when you take that, you know exactly how it's going to be, regardless of what state you're in, whether like the one uh, respondent told us about getting moved to a different state and plugging in, it works everywhere. And that is a quick training. Like all these trainings are online, they're free. They result in a certificate. They go on your resume and so forth. These are, these are, and they're great training. They're, they're very well done. The, the second one in the baseline is the ICS 100. This is your introduction to incident command system. Today you got, you know, the wave tops, as I said on that. Uh, if you take this course, you go even deeper into it and, um, and you'll be able to understand how you plug in in various ways or how you could plug in after taking that training. Uh, there, it also is a gateway to other kinds of training that is important to cooperative extension outside disaster uh, as a response to include things like active shooter and other things which are becoming of interest here in, in my state. The continuing stuff, you know, sort of the more uh, advanced training, if you will, is uh, ICS 200 for single resources and initial action incidents. Uh, and then you have IS 800, which is the national response framework introduction, which gets more into the policy level of things. And then you can see a host of other things there that you can take that are generalist, uh, including ICS 300, 400. And then if you go on the website, there's these position-specific trainings for all those job descriptions I mentioned in the charts. Uh, there are specific trainings that you can become certified to be able to take those roles in your municipality, uh, town, county, and so forth. <clears throat> and increasingly, those are requirements um, for, for grant money from the federal government. People have to be trained up on this within your within your local municipality, and if that's the case, then it's certainly a place extension should be paying attention because uh, we don't mind grant money. Uh, finally, where do you find this training? Here it is. This is the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency's Emergency uh, Emergency Management Institute. This is sort of the splash page where uh, the training is located. Um, it is super easy to find it. You do need to sign up for your student identification number and write that down and keep it somewhere safe so that you can refer back to it because from there on, your certificates are generated uh, from that. And uh, you see that, again, I wanna emphasize no cost for this training. It's online. Certificates are offered. We are hopeful in the Extension Disaster Education Network and are going to strongly encourage that everybody at least gets those first two basic ones done. Uh, that our delegates are involved and, and we are encouraging people to go further than that because clearly it is, it is one of the things we have to be competent in in order to play a significant and meaningful role in disaster preparedness and response, which is core to, I believe, all of our missions in extension. Uh, it has to do with people. It has to do with their well-being. There are a number of documents that I've been uh, talking about that are important for you to be able to have access to, and that's why they're, they're fully written out here on the, um, on, on the slide. Uh, I'm not gonna read every one of these, but these are documents and frameworks and directives and so forth that I've mentioned or have been mentioned on slides, and this is a ready reference for you. Uh, I would pay special attention if you're interested in this kind of stuff to Presidential Policy Directive 8, the National Preparedness one, about in the middle of the bullet points. That one will give you, if you ever have find yourself in front of a uh, a state director of cooperative extension or someone that says, hey, tell me why it is that we are we should be involved. Uh, you read through that national preparedness thing and get your argument points ready and you'll be good to go. That thing is a useful document. Um, lastly, I want to um, ask you if you have any questions. Um, there, there, we have, I don't know, five minutes anyway where we can, we can maybe have a conversation uh, about uh, questions that you have, hurdles that you foresee, or if you want to talk more about successes, we can do that too. Is there anybody that has any questions or comments? Yes, hi Keith, this is Elaine Bailey from Maryland. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Elaine. Oh good, because a while ago I think I might have been the culprit you referenced because I was trying to talk, but I didn't get through. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, Betsy Green, my colleague from Arizona, Chris Heine, my colleague from Oklahoma and I um, are looking at some different ways to look how, um, 
really get horse owners prepared for what to do once emergencies um, and natural disasters hit. And we recognize that involving kids helps to get people on board. And we know because of our historic roots and extension that that's how we get people to adapt and to um, really use a lot of the tools and technologies out there. Does anybody have any um, insight about how to get emergency management teams in different locales um, aware of the contribution potential for youth in such situations? Well, I hope that some of the, our, our audience will answer that. And I, I will briefly say that I've just become aware of some activity through FEMA for youth ambassadors and some scholarships and some recognition that youth can get that in New York, we're hoping to tie to some of our 4-H programming and to sort of expand that area via, via that FEMA program. Are there others that have had a chance to unmute or whatever and want to address that one? This is Gregory Martin with Penn State again. Um, we, we, a lot of times, will funnel uh, information back through the 4-H uh, communications network to the uh, livestock clubs and horse clubs that uh, are actually working with horses and to get the word out there. Uh, we have seen cases, um, especially out west with wildfires, where moving horses proved to be a problem simply because nobody checks their trailers until they, you know, in an emergency situation. And we actually had horses falling through the bottom of the trailers or having flat tires. So uh, it is an issue and everybody should be uh, checking their, their equipment. Um, but generally, when we move things out, we try to hit the, the, our extension resources that are actually connected directly with the, the largest impacting audience. For avian flu, for example, we made a, um, a crib sheet for all of our extension offices. There's 67 of them. And so that if anybody called in with a sick bird question or to report sick birds, uh, the uh, staff that would receive the call would know where to direct the call next to our diagnostic laboratories and other experts in the field. So maybe an, an approach like that could be done for the equine situations that you're trying to prepare for. Excellent. Thank you. I, I do note that there are a number of, of comments and things in the chat box here. We're at uh, 155357 um, with three minutes to go in the session, so I won't be able to address all of those now, but if we go over and people are still hanging around, we can maybe get into some of that. Um, I do want to uh, encourage you, if you want to stick around afterwards, I'm, I'm here, and I don't know that Scott's got anywhere to go right away. So, <laughs> Thanks, so, Keith. Yeah, no problem, Scott. So, so we can hang out. Uh, if we want to continue the conversation, but I do want to respect everybody's time. Uh, so uh, there is a survey uh, that we would encourage you to to go to. Uh, Scott, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Really, this is a short 10 question survey that helps us look at how we did this webinar and profile how we can do better webinars and other, other subjects. So please just take a few moments and answer it. And uh, the results can be shared with people that take it. They can see the build on it. And we'll use it to format better webinars in the future. Of course, this one's going to be a little tough to beat, but we'll work on it. Thanks, Scott. And, and while you're uh, going to that link and, and doing that survey, I, I see I got two minutes. And I, I would like to just address one question that was about um, how it is that Extension is involved in this uh, Empire Shield exercise that's been going on the last couple of days and today. Um, that happened as a result of doing what I suggested uh, early on when I became the state uh, point of contact and delegate for Eden. Uh, we made a commitment here at Cornell that we were gonna get really after this and we went and talked to all the people at our Ag and Markets Department as well as our Department of Environment and Conservation because those are in the operational areas we thought we could do the most work and be of most help. And over time, we've become a trusted partner for them, especially when it comes to agricultural uh, issues in the natural disaster contexts. Um, and now we're, we're just part of it. We've been written into the radiological incident manual for the state. We're increasingly being written into the actual plan for ESF 11 um, for the state. And it's not really rocket science. It just takes that first warm handshake and being able to show what we do, what extension actually is, is what they want. Keep in mind, Homeland Security Department doesn't have extension, just USDA does. 
So uh, we're in a great position to leverage our resources just by making those relationships. I hope that answers uh, that question. Um, now we're at one minute, and I hope people are taking the survey. I'm going to advance the screen one more to uh, thank all of you for being here today uh, and for your questions and input, and I hope that some of you can stick around or that you'll uh, respond to us collectively as we reach out to you for more of your stories of how things are working for you so that we can capture them. And um, Scott would like to also th say thanks. Scott, you have some stuff you want to say? No, we appreciate everybody joining and we'll be sharing the recording as soon as we get it pulled together so that you can uh, look at this presentation later and share it with others. Thank you. And uh, it looks like um, Elaine, thank you for posting that SurveyMonkey link there for people to be able to get. Others have posted it now too since I moved off that slide. Please do uh, go ahead and, and fill that out. Um, I'm easy to find if you want to talk to me offline about any of this. I know Scott is too. I thank you all very much for being here. And uh, if I, I'm going to monitor the chat box. And Scott, are you going to stick around for a few? I will. I'll stop the recording in a couple minutes, but we'll, we'll stay online. Okay. So I, um, officially we're done, but I'm monitoring. And if people want to open a mic or put something in the chat box, um, we can have an informal discussion.